Hello, this is Dr. Stefano, and this is a short um, masterclass for uh, the IRS PhD students. For those of you who uh, don't know, this masterclass series was established some six, seven years ago at the IRS uh, when uh, Professor Xanthaki was the um, head of research studies. And the general idea is that we offer our students, the ILS PhD students, something extra, something beyond our usual lectures to PhD students as part of the uh, how to get a PhD in law or the research methods 15-day um, course. So this is the um, the uh, uh, the lecture which will allow you to explore things um, that um, we have not already discussed. And usually, this is done, of course, face-to-face. Uh, -face. This is done in small classes. It is the master class series, and it's organized by PhD students at the ILS, for PhD students at the ILS. Unfortunately, because of the coronavirus, I cannot be with you, although perhaps we could organize a live lecture, and this is something uh, we can perhaps discuss if the measures keep for a lot longer than uh, we expect. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about comparative work, um, comparative research, and those of you who uh, have uh, come to the How to Get a PhD in Law uh, series of one-day uh, training sessions have probably listened to my uh, lecture on uh, comparative law. So I don't want to repeat it. There's also a, a video, a version of this lecture on the VLE. It is, um, it, it is there for LLM. Uh, students um, doing research in comparative law. So I want to talk about something else today, something that we haven't discussed uh, already. And that is one particular aspect of doing comparative research, which usually um, draws the most questions from students. And that is whether or not and how one can incorporate comparative research in a non-comparative uh, PhD. And this is very interesting, and um, especially if you want to do research in, uh, in an area of the European Union, at some point there is no doubt that um, comparative aspect, looking at all 27, 26 members, will, of course, strengthen uh, your argument. And um, the whole PhD might not be about uh, a comparative topic, but you feel that comparative research will strengthen your argument. How do we do this? Do we just say, ah, well, this is what they do in Germany, Spain, Italy, or do we do it in a different way? Um, let me start with basics. Firstly, is it possible to have, let's say, a comparative chapter in a non-comparative PhD? Yes, it is. And usually, <clears throat> I also tell students, and it's a bad idea. That doesn't mean that it cannot be done. It simply means that it is difficult. That is why I say it's a bad idea. And I know it is difficult because I did this for my PhD and it was the most difficult chapter. Uh, I was researching the uh, the Maastricht Treaty because I'm ancient, um, and um, it ended up being a chapter of twenty thousand words. All other chapters were around ten thousand. This chapter was around twenty thousand. So it stood out. It um, it it did strengthen my argument, but it was difficult because I had to, in a way, reinvent the wheel for just a small part 
of my PhD. What do I mean here? I mean that because it's going to be a single chapter or perhaps one or two chapters, uh, comparative chapters, it does not mean that we do not follow the comparative methodology. We still need comparative criteria. Even it's going to be even if it's going to be just one chapter, you still need comparative criteria and you still need to pursue the exact same set of comparative criteria in each and every one of the jurisdictions. Um, so a lot of work and the danger is that this work might end up being a little bit descriptive because if you're going to research 26, 27 countries, you will need to present your criteria, present the problem and analyze the problem. And if you only have 10, 20,000 words to look at 20 odd countries, it might make it uh, a little descriptive. So you have to be very careful you have to make sure that you choose a very small set of criteria, two or three, three maximum, if you're going to do a comparative chapter in a PhD. And of course, then apply exactly the same set of criteria in each and every jurisdiction, each and every, if it is the EU, each and every EU member state. So, this is the difficulty. It is not that somehow this chapter is, is devoid of reason and you have to find a way to incorporate it. No, it is easy to incorporate it. You, in, in your initial methodology, you will say that one of the things you're going to do is to look at perhaps the EU or, I don't know, another organization, and you're going to look at it in the context of the hypothesis and on the basis of one, two, three maximum. My, my advice would be to have three criteria maximum. So um, this is the difficulty. Are there any tricks? There aren't really any tricks. Uh, otherwise, if, if there was a trick and we knew the trick, I would simply say there isn't a problem because you can use this trick and that's it. Um, the problem is to find criteria that fit your hypothesis. What's more, criteria that make sense and criteria that have already been researched. They're not arbitrary. You can't say, well, I will also look at it on the basis of ABC because I think it's a good idea. Because the external will come in and say, well, good idea to you, but uh, how do we know that we can learn anything by looking at this set of criteria? How do we know that anything can be proven? Who has argued this? Who has researched this? Who has proven this in the past? When? And suddenly, this fantastic idea, because it is a fantastic idea, if, to incorporate comparative research into a PhD simply because comparative research often produces impressive results. It's one thing to say, well, my evidence points towards this direction, and another thing to say, my evidence and the evidence of 26 member states points to this direction. Of course, it strengthens your argument. Of course, it makes it very impressive. Of course, you will use your comparative tables, your comparative graphs, and suddenly there will be a visual effect as well. So that is, I mean, that is one of the beauties of the comparative method. That is why one of the reasons which is why we use it, because it is so strong. Um, so you need to find a way, you need to find criteria that will work in tandem with your hypothesis. This is the difficult bit. The difficult bit is not doing the comparative work, as you know, although we will talk about this too. 
The difficult bit is to incorporate it seamlessly into your methodology. A few things about applying the criteria. And as I said, if you're only going to have one or two chapters in your PhD, really you're looking at the maximum, I would say, from a practical point of view, a maximum of three criteria. Otherwise, you will end up um, having a very descriptive chapter. And what do I mean by this? So your chapter will, I suspect, be organized, uh, structured, according to the criteria rather or you could do it according to jurisdiction but then a single chapter will need to have a minimum of 27 sections to be subdivided by three one for each criterion so you're looking at, at a difficult chapter um i have to say that in my day when i researched the um Maastricht Treaty, there were only 15 member states and I found it difficult to, um, and I only had three criteria and I found it difficult and I had to rewrite the chapter a number of times. I found it difficult to, to have a chapter that was not uh, descriptive. So perhaps you can use another technique and that technique would be to have the descriptive part early in the chapter and then uh, with the use of tables, with the use of graphs. Look at each and every criterion. So your chapter will have three large subsections, one for each criterion rather than 26. Uh, and then you will not necessarily need to subdivide each one of the subsections, the one for each criterion, per country. If you want to do it, you can use perhaps one page to have a very large table which will show with one sentence for each criterion how each country complies with this criterion. So criterion number one, 26, 27 sentences in, in a one page or one and a half pages table suddenly you have the whole list, all the countries, and as we say, epigrammatically explain to the reader uh, exactly how each member state does or does not comply. Um, and uh, you will need to have your comparative table and perhaps if you want a graph as well. And, and, and suddenly, as I said, there will be a visual effect, it will be a strong chapter. So, to repeat, one way of doing this would be to structure the chapter, the comparative chapter, with an introduction where you will explain what you're doing in this chapter, why, explain that this would be a comparative chapter, list the criteria you're going to use, explain why you think this set of criteria is suitable and where did you find it. It's a good idea not to have arbitrary criteria or criteria you've picked from different experts. One criterion from this expert, one criterion from that expert, because then it is arbitrary because my immediate, as an external, my immediate question is, how do those three criteria fit in? They're taken from different uh, researches. So on what basis can they form a coherent body? On what basis can they prove anything? Again, uh, methodological issues. So you need to explain where you found the criteria. Ideally, you want the criteria to have been suggested by an acknowledged expert. Um, or it may be that in the course of, um, of proving your hypothesis for this PhD, this is a set of established criteria that you've used before in previous chapters or you're going to use in the coming chapters. Uh, and you've already discussed uh, the existence of this set of criteria, why they're useful, where you got them from, why do you think they're relevant to your hypothesis. 
in which case you're fine. So you're going to start with this, you're going to have the introduction, then you will probably need to have a short section in that comparative chapter explaining each one uh, of uh, the criteria, the descriptive part, and then the analysis part, where you are going, as I said, to structure it in three large sections, one per criterion, and inside each one of these sections, you will discuss the criterion with reference to each and every member state. You might not, ideally you want to discuss it with reference to each and every member state. It may well be that some of the smaller member states don't really, I mean, they're fine, they comply with the criterion, and some of the larger member states who are probably big players uh, have different ideas to ensure that you do not ignore a set of countries, to ensure that you do not ignore some sections of the EU, you use this table. You use this long table where you describe criterion and how it applies. So, so table two columns. On the left hand side, you have the uh, criterion and, and on the right hand side, uh, how it applies to uh, the country. Or it could be a table just with lines uh, uh, saying, you know, for each country, this is how it applies, one sentence or one and a half sentences. And suddenly you have shown that you have looked at all the member states. You can then proceed in the sections and discuss some of the member states. Um, not all member states care about all policy areas, about all issues, and usually it is a small set of member states which matter, uh, and this is probably the case for each of the criteria. So you can concentrate your discussion on those. Um, for your conclusions, remember, in the conclusions we do not we do not write anything that comes to our head that we haven't already discussed uh, in the conclusions, even in the conclusions for individual chapters, we say very specifically what this chapter set out to achieve and how we achieved it. Um, we do not tackle new issues. We do not introduce new topics in the conclusions. We do not introduce new ideas and we certainly don't say things like, well, I haven't touched on this because. No, this is what I set out to achieve, and this is how I achieved it. So, um, again, I'm afraid no tricks, just basic good organization. To conclude uh, in this short uh, lecture. It is possible to have a comparative chapter in a non-comparative PhD. It is not easy because uh, you need to apply a set of criteria to each and every jurisdiction. Um, that means that the chapter runs the risk of being a little bit on the... Uh, I wouldn't say it would be a, a, a descriptive chapter, but runs the risk of being a, dis a descriptive chapter. Um, it is a good idea to organize the chapter uh, in sections per criterion, and inside each section, look at the individual jurisdictions. Could be, in the case of the EU, it could be, I don't know, 20-something, or if you're not looking, at the EU, you're looking at the smaller organization, obviously, even better. Um, again, make sure that you uh, show that you have touched on each and every uh, jurisdiction and that you discuss in your analysis the important arguments, not necessarily arguments for each and every country. It may well be that, for example, if you're doing I don't know, research on intellectual property. It may well be that Malta or Greece don't have specific issues with 
uh, intellectual property while other uh, member states do. I'm just saying that, not saying this is necessarily the truth, but um, so I hope this has helped today. Um, hopefully when this thing is over, when the lockdown is over, I will come and talk to you and we can discuss this at length. Um, as I said, the, the idea here is that we offer our students that extra bit um, value added, as they say, uh, in the EU. Thank you for listening to me and uh, hopefully I will see you very, very soon.